I'm Cindy Kelly. This is Wednesday, June 24th, 2015, and I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts uh, with Peter Galliston. Now, my first question for you is to tell me your name and spell it. Okay. My name is uh, Peter Gallison, G-A-L-I-S-O-N, and uh, I'm a professor here at Harvard in physics and history of science and other things. 20th century physics has two great pillars to it. One of them is the relativity theories by Albert Einstein, and which had contributions from others, but in many ways he led the way. And then in quantum mechanics, which was much more of a collective activity and that drew on Einstein too, but uh, Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg and Erwin Schrodinger and many others. Uh, those two accomplishments, like the relativity theories of Einstein 1905 and 1915, and then quantum physics, which really begins around the turn of the century, around 1900, with the first indications that nature may not be continuous up through Einstein's contributions, for example, showing that light was broken up into photons, into particles, and then eventually to a full-blown quantum theory in 1926. So you have these two aspects of physics, both of which play a role in the atomic bomb and then go on after the atomic bomb to being very important in the rest of the development of modern science up to and including the present. But those are the two foundational moments and they represent some of the greatest intellectual accomplishments of all time. The aspect of uh, relativity theory that has to do with the development of the atomic bomb is probably mainly the most famous equation of physics, E equals mc squared, that was a consequence of a kind of addendum to Einstein's special theory of relativity back in 1905. The basic idea and relevance of E equals mc squared was that small amounts of matter could be converted into very large amounts of energy. And Einstein realized that this could have an importance in radioactive phenomena, but never in his early work in 1905 or even the years after, suspected that it was really important for a possible weapon or the generation of massive amounts of electricity. But that changed in the period just before World War II where Lise Meitner and Hahn and others began to really understand this notion of nuclear fission, that you could break apart a big nucleus like that of uranium and turn it into two smaller nuclei, generating immense amounts of, of energy. And one of the ways that those early reflections on nuclear physics invoked relativity was that they could see that there was a difference between the sum total of the masses of the smaller pieces of the uranium atom and the uranium nucleus itself. So that difference came out in energy. And that was, the, that was one of the ways that they understood what nuclear fission was. So relativity was important as one of the paths of understanding about what was going on when you split a uranium nucleus. Quantum mechanics is relevant to the making of the nuclear bomb in lots of different ways. Quantum mechanics became the idiom, the language of modern physics. It was first used to understand how the electrons would attach themselves and make change their orbits and so on, it explaining much of chemistry and was important for many aspects of physics. But in the years before the atomic bomb, people like Hans Bethe and others realized that quantum mechanics could be used to explain what was going on inside the nucleus itself. And so quantum mechanics really is the framework of the new nuclear physics and how it was going to be understood. The people that were involved in creating this new science of uh, quantum mechanics were the people who were at the very center of understanding what was going on theoretically in the possibility of building a nuclear weapon. Perhaps none more importantly than Hans Bethe, the person who eventually won the Nobel Prize for explaining why the sun shines. And he ran the theory group at Los Alamos. He had 
working with him, an astonishing group of physicists that included Feynman, the very young Feynman, I should say, and, and many, many others. But uh, he was really the leader of that, of, of, that, of that group. The idea of quantum mechanics really begins with the notion that the world isn't continuous. It, not every process can be smooth in its understanding. And that sometimes matter and energy behave in little jumps, in discrete packets. And you can't go any smaller than that. So if you break up light of a certain frequency, and Einstein understood this in 1905, say a certain color of light, a certain purple, that looked at finely enough, light was made up of individual particles, photons, as they've come to be called. And that these photons always represent the minimum amount of light energy that you can have. You can't have half a photon or two-thirds of a photon. You might think that the world was always divisible in the way we imagine from our everyday life, like carving up a bar of butter. You can carve it up into halves or quarters or sixteenths or thousand twenty-fourths or whatever it is. You can always find a smaller division of the butter, or so we imagine in our everyday experience. Quantum mechanics says that's not true. There are certain basic units of something like light energy, and you never get less than that. And this new understanding of matter and energy, of how even things that looked continuous, like light, could be ultimately understood in terms of indivisible particles, was one side of quantum mechanics. The other weird side was that every particle, an electron, for instance, which you might think of as being a like a little BB, only smaller, actually behaves in many respects like a wave. So we have this weird correspondence that everything that looks to us like a particle can also be a wave, and everything that looks continuous like a wave can be broken up into particles. So this understanding this aspect of matter, which was radically different from anything that classical physics taught us, was the great revolution of the 1920s and that forms the foundational understanding of our world even today. One of the crucial and unnerving aspects of the history of physics in the 20th century is that nuclear fission, the idea that you could break up something like a uranium nucleus and then have the parts fly apart with enormous amounts of energy, was discovered just before World War II. And in a way, the timing was extraordinary because it meant that at the very outset of hostilities, many of the belligerent countries began to think and wonder if it might be possible that one of these breakups could cause another breakup of a, of a, of a nucleus, cause another one, cause another one, cause another one in what's famously and commonly known as a chain reaction. The, the physics behind that was that when a nucleus like the uranium nucleus breaks apart, it not only flies into two parts, but some of the constituent pieces of a nucleus, called a neutron, come out from there and can cause the breakup of other nuclei. The uranium nucleus is, is very interesting because it's, it's the biggest nucleus that can hold itself together in a pretty easy way. But it's right on the limit, because inside a nucleus, any nucleus, are a bunch of positively charged particles, protons, and these neutral particles, called neutrons. And positive particles don't like to hang out together. They're just like, if you have like charges, they, they want to fly apart. So every nucleus has got these particles that are trying to fly apart inside them, but they're held together by another force that's even stronger than the electric repulsion of positive particles for one another, and that we, we sometimes call the, the strong force or the strong nuclear force. And those are bound in together. So you, you can imagine, say, a bunch of ping pong balls, all positively charged. They want to fly apart, and they've got little rubber bands attached to them that are very strong. And they work terrifically to hold this thing together until 
you stretch them too far and then they snap. And once those bonds snap, then this thing flies apart, like the proverbial bats out of hell. So you can build up nuclei with more and more positive charges, more and more protons, until you get to about the size of a uranium nucleus. And the uranium nucleus is just balanced between the little rubber bands, this nuclear force that holds this thing together, and the positively charged particles that want to fly apart just electrically. So it's right balanced. It's just holding itself together. If you add another proton to it or another proton after that, that becomes more unstable. But uranium we still find on the Earth in pretty large quantities. And that means that it's stable enough to last. If you go above uranium on, you know, add more protons, we tend not to find them naturally. This is very important for the nuclear weapons project, and I can talk about that in a moment. But start with the uranium nucleus. So it, if you could start this thing wobbling, imagine a kind of a, a ball that was flexible. And if you started to, it started to oscillate, if you hit it gently enough so it started to just go like into a kind of barbell shape, eventually the pieces of it would get far enough apart so that the nuclear forces, the little rubber bands I was talking about, can't hold anymore and then the sides fly apart with enormous energy. Because once they're not bound by those rubber bands, the positive, positive electrical repulsion drives these things apart very fast, releasing enormous amounts of energy. So that's what happens in nuclear fission. A neutron comes along, it starts this thing wobbling, the parts start to separate to the, start to look like a, a barbell with you know, globs on the end separated by a thinner middle, and then that breaks and flies apart. That's nuclear fission. And that was what was discovered in the end of the 1930s, right before World War II. People could make uranium nuclei fly apart, and they had a theoretical understanding, or the a beginning of a theoretical understanding of how that took place. So then people started contacting their governments. Werner Heisenberg went to the high officials in the German armaments establishment and said, you know, we could, it's possible that a bomb could be made out of nuclear fission. And uh, uh, Albert Einstein was persuaded by a group of other physicists, in including um, some of the other leaders in this field, and they wrote a letter to the president under Einstein's name and said to President Roosevelt, look here, this could be very important militarily. The Germans have got control over uranium supplies from what was then the Belgian Congo and other places. Uh, they've got very good physicists. This could be important in warfare. And you, the government of the United States, should look into this because it could turn out to be a decisive weapon. So. That kind of conversation was happening all over the world as the world was tumbling into the dark hostility of World War II. Many of the refugees from Europe were all too aware from personal experience, from family members, from everything that they were following about the development of what became soon Hitler's war in Europe, uh, told them that this was an extremely dangerous possibility if, if Hitler had, could get control of nuclear weapons. And though nobody knew how to build an atomic bomb, there was a real worry that with sufficient uranium and the excellent physicists that Nazi Germany still had in its corner, that this, be, this was a real threat. So some of the scientists who knew the German scientists and some aspects of the new developments in physics that might make this nuclear weapon possible, went to Einstein. Leo Szilard, Edward Teller, and Eugene Wigner, some of the great physicists of the time, and they persuaded Einstein that he should put his name on a letter to the President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, warning about the possibility of nuclear weapons, and specifically warning that this might be something that Germany could do. So they needed Einstein because Einstein was then, as now, by orders of magnitude, the most famous physicist in the world. And Teller and 
Szilard and Wigner might be well known in physics circles, but they had no public authority at all, whereas Einstein for 20 years had been not only one of the best recognized scientists in all of history, but had been somebody who had been in conversation with world leaders across the globe. So a letter from Einstein to Roosevelt would get read, and they thought this was a way to the highest reaches of the American government, and perhaps as a way of getting the government of the United States to put some resources into monitoring the situation and perhaps doing something about it. At first, the response was rather lukewarm. This seemed like a rather speculative problem compared to the immediate need, war needs of the United States and what was, how the war was actually going to be fought. Even some physicists were dubious that in the here and now that a nuclear weapon was going to be decisive for this war being fought at that moment as Hitler's armies crashed through Europe and uh, threatened such enormous uh, human and material destruction. There were people like I. I. Rabi, who was, again, one of the great physicists, who, when he had to choose between working on the atomic bomb and on radar, said, look, we have to win this war now, and that means radar. Whether the war would last long enough and there would be this, the possibility of actually building nuclear weapons was, for Rabi and others, a somewhat more speculative enterprise. But the war lasted much longer than anybody expected. It lasted longer than the Nazis expected. It last, lasted much longer than the Americans and the British expected. Um, it was a war that, uh, as many wars turn out, to be much more destructive and much more long-lasting than people thought at the beginning. And that made it possible for a project like the atomic bomb to actually lead to a weapon that was used in battle. Uh, if the war had ended in one or two or three years, as people expected, it wouldn't have been. So it wasn't crazy for people to be suspicious at the beginning of the war that this weapon might not be ready on time, so to speak. But the United States government eventually did give very high priority to the building of a, an atomic weapon. And it's one of the extraordinary features of the war that a field that didn't exist in 1939 nuclear physics in some real sense. I mean, nu nuclear weapons industry was nothing. It was the idea in a couple of people's heads. Uh, it went by the end of the war to be a multi-billion dollar enterprise in 1945 dollars, the equivalent of hundreds of billions of dollars in, uh, in, current, in, in current currency. So what had to happen was truly gar gargantuan. This was it would require, as Niels Bohr suspected, essentially transforming the country into an enormous factory from coast to coast, from Hanford uh, in the northwest all the way to uh, Oak Ridge uh, in Tennessee, in Los Alamos, in universities across the country. It would take hundreds of thousands of people to build these plants at Oak Ridge and Hanford. It was an extraordinary effort that required um, industrial scale plants, the likes of which nobody had ever imagined. Some of those plants became the biggest factories in any industrial production uh, practically overnight. The, the project really gets going in 1942 and is in full operation uh, by 44. Uh, they test uh, the weapon in 45 and use it in August of 45. It's a very accelerated project and it's why people sometimes refer to needing a Manhattan project for this or that, meaning an all-out effort that takes essentially the resources of a country and directs them towards an extraordinarily focused goal. But that, that required a massive investment. The atomic bomb cost $2 billion, roughly the same price as what radar cost the United States, roughly the same price that, the, that Nazi Germany put into their buzz bomb and uh, their, their cruise missile and, and ballistic missile projects, the V1 and the V2. So these are world-changingly large projects of a scientific technical sort, and they brought together not just theoretical physicists, but new aspects of computation, theoretical work, uh, chemists, 
metallurgists, uh, all sorts of, 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 of resources, including people who knew how to scale up industry from thimble-sized processes to something in the world's biggest factories. So it required uh, some of the biggest corporations in the United States. It required the U.S. Army. It required people like General Groves, who had built the Pentagon, essentially, the, then the world's biggest building, uh, to scale up from what had been very small-scale work uh, in the nuclear physicists' laboratories to something that would uh, change the world. So you might ask what happened to the possibility of nuclear weapons in other countries. Well, the United States was working very closely with Britain and Canada. Some of the plants actually were located in, that did fundamental work on the bomb were located in Canada. Especially early in the war, the, 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 the British did extremely important work on, on the possibility of nuclear weapons, as they did on radar, which was then shipped over and expanded and developed in much deeper ways in the United States. But the British played a very important role in this process. Uh, but in the Axis countries, things were quite different. In Japan, there was, in fact, a small and unsuccessful attempt to think about nuclear weapons, uh, but it never had anything like the resources that they would need to actually convert this into an industrial process of a scale that could produce nuclear weapons. But they, they, they were good physicists in Japan, and they knew that some of what needed to happen, but it never really got off the ground. In Germany, it went farther, and Heisenberg was a very well-known and recognized figure in Germany. He was not altogether considered trustworthy by the Nazi regime. On the other hand, he wasn't considered an enemy of the state either, but he was in that sort of nether region. Um, and he had a group uh, that began to think very seriously about nuclear weapons. They produced reports that went to the uh, armaments folks in, in, in Germany uh, that showed the possibility or advanced the hypothesis that it might be possible to build a uranium-based bomb, and even that there might be a possibility of making a plutonium-based bomb, which is the other way of, another way of making a nuclear weapon. But they never advanced for a couple of different reasons. One was that they made some mistakes, that Heisenberg and his colleagues, his theoretical colleagues, came up with a, with, with a variety of different estimates about how much uranium of a particular kind you would need to actually make a bomb. And it was much bigger than the amount that you actually require. And so that created both the difficulty of manufacturing that much uranium of this special sort, called uranium-235, and also the, pop the possibility of delivering it by air or other means, by missile or air, uh, became almost impossible to imagine. It would be such a big object. And that limited its potential use. Uh, so that was one problem. The second was that the German program of building reactors required what's called heavy water, which is a kind of water but with larger nucleus uh, in, the, in, the, in the water than in the hydrogen that's in the in H2O than, than, than normally found. And they built a plant in Norway, and that plant was repeatedly bombed and sabotaged by resistance fighters in a way that eventually des destroyed the possibility of getting heavy water to build their reactors, which was a necessary precursor for advancing all kinds of nuclear research. And so that was a second problem. Related to that, facilities in Germany by 44 were being bombed all the time, and it was extremely difficult uh, for them to uh, continue building. And then probably more important than anything else is that Hitler's top echelons and Hitler himself never wanted to invest the kind of resources that would have been needed to build an atomic bomb. They did for uh, engineering projects. They built jets, which successfully flew in the war. They built cruise missiles. They built uh, V-2 ballistic missiles. Um, and that kind of resource allotment was what would have been required 
to build an atomic bomb. And the atomic bomb was never funded at that level. It's related to a, a rather deep point that illuminates something about the Manhattan Project, which is that the Germans funded engineering very well. And engineers, the rocket engineers, jet engineers, um, radar engineers, got a fair amount of money to do what they were going to do. And in the case of the missile makers and airplane designers, that sh showed up in usable weapons during the war. And they were able to bear, you know, using slave labor and killing tens of thousands of concentration camp prisoners, they were able to dig into the side of the Hartz Mountains and build protected sites uh, in ways that couldn't be bombed. And it, it paid off in terms of producing these wonder weapons or revenge weapons that the British, that the Germans had, had made. So that's what you would have had to do to build an atomic bomb. And the Germans never allocated that amount, partly because they never really respected the scientists in the way that they respected the engineers. So German scientists, not Heisenberg and his inner circle of you know, the sort of Nobel Prize level scientists, not that they were drafted and sent to the front, but a whole younger generation of physicists and chemists were sent off and only recalled into a protective zone of war work rather late, by which time many of them were dead on the Eastern Front or elsewhere. And even when there were scientists, they didn't work that well with the engineers. There was never particularly close relations between Nazi Germany engineers and physicists. Whereas in the United States, that alliance was very deep, not without its problems. There were moments when that was, there was tension, but the, the physicists, the engineers, and the chemists, the metallurgists worked in a concentrated and fairly focused way under the leadership of J. Robert Oppenheimer in a way that was absolutely undoable in Germany for all sorts of reasons of class and professional distinction and prestige and their relationship to the military. It goes deep into society, but engineers and physicists in the Manhattan Project worked together very well. And the physicists ended up being utterly transformed by their relationship with engineers during World War II in ways that reshaped physics in the post-war period in the United States very profoundly. It made possible the building of the big, um, what eventually became the big uh, particle physics laboratories, the big national physics laboratories, uh, uh, Brookhaven and then later Fermilab and, and, and so on in, in ways that were just impossible in, 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 in Germany. So that's a, that, that difference between about funding, protecting the scientists, keeping them working with engineers, uh, a harmonious and focused directed research effort in the Manhattan Project all distinguished it from what was possible in, in, in Nazi Germany. The Manhattan Project was important in the history of science in many ways, but one of them was that from early on J. Robert Oppenheimer, uh, who was himself a, a very good theorist, brought in and put in important roles the best theorists around. Uh, the theory group was led by Hans Bethe, um, the physicist who figured out why the sun shines and played a very important role in developing quantum theory and applying it to the nuclear domain, but many others too. Edward Teller was involved with the project, who was himself a, a major contributor to theoretical physics, so was Szilard, uh, so was um, Eugene Wigner, uh, John von Neumann played a very important role, Enrico Fermi. These are some of the great, great theoretical physicists of the 20th century. So they were there, and they brought in then even younger physicists, people like Richard Feynman, uh, Julian uh, Schwinger played an important theoretical role on the radar side, but the Americans brought in theoretical physics into the heart of these efforts to develop and understand weapons and countermeasures to weapons in a way that the Germans ne never did. The second is they brought in very good the uh, experimental physicists, and they, of course, in the United States especially, had been absolutely dominant in physics. 
theorists up until World War II in the United States didn't play the same role that theoretical physicists had played in, in Europe. But that really changed with, with World War II, partly because of the homegrown theorists like Oppenheimer, uh, who had then spent time in Europe studying with some of the greats there. And then this extraordinary group of refugee theorists who came, uh, who fled Europe, many of them uh, Jewish, from Hungary, from Germany, from many other places within Europe, and a large number of them converged on the Manhattan Project. Surprisingly, perhaps from our perspective, the Manhattan Project was considered uh, less urgent as a secret project than radar. Radar was the one that was harder to get into in terms of security clearance, and many of these refugee physicists found their way more easily into the atomic bomb project than they did into the radar project. They wanted to serve the United States in any way they could, and uh, in some ways the security bar uh, for foreign physicists uh, was put it in such a way that the, it was easier for them to work on the atomic bomb than it was on radar. So there are a lot of reasons why theory was strong in this group, but it took the leadership of somebody like Oppenheimer to put uh, theory in an important and e in some ways co-equal role with the experiment. And then the third side of, of the triangle, so to speak, uh, that made this project possible was the material world of, of instruments and factories uh, that had to work with the theory, the theorists and the experimentalists. Without the massive support of uh, the group around uh, DuPont, for example, uh, a people that had experience scaling up nylon from a thimble to a world industry, uh, the physicists alone would have had no idea how to scale up. They had zero experience going from a tiny desktop process to uh, factories much bigger than the biggest air, air, airframe or aircraft frame or, or car factories that existed in the United States. So that combination of industrial and instrument support, theory and experiment made possible the Manhattan Project and distinguished it from any prior project in the history of, of science and technology. Uh, E.O. Lawrence was one of the great American experimentalists. And he, under his leadership, Berkeley, uh, University of California, Berkeley, built some of the first cyclotrons and really developed this new technology in extraordinary ways, using a combination of private money, uh, state support, the, the state of California support, and other means, they began to put together a series of larger and larger cyclotrons so that by the time you got to World War II, um, this was a technology that Americans understood very well. And Lawrence was really the master of building these things. The cyclotron was one of the ways that you could accelerate uranium nuclei and uh, uranium atoms and, and separate them uh, to the useful kind for nuclear weapons and the useless kind. You had to take this less than 1% of, of uranium that you dig out of the ground, and that less than 1% was what you actually needed to isolate to make a nuclear weapon. That's called enrichment. And it's uh, much in the news over the last decades because because it's one of the paths you need, you, you, there are different ways to do this. You can have centrifuges and spin this, a gaseous uranium around and separate the heavy part from the light part, the way you do with the light parts and the heavy parts of blood in a, in a medical office. Um, but you can do that, or you can use these cyclotrons. And someone like Lawrence was therefore crucial to the atomic bomb project and was one of the people who uh, really had to be enlisted into scaling up into this factory-sized outfit. But Lawrence was never, not in any stage of his career, a master of the theory of, of nu this new nuclear science. And so from early on, he'd relied on, on theorists to help focus on what the interesting questions might be. And although he and Oppenheimer never got along particularly well, they worked together on this project. And Lawrence threw himself uh, body and soul into building this, these separation facilities, these 
racetracks, as they were called, these cyclotrons out in, in, uh, in, 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 the, in the Manhattan Project. And he worked so hard on it, he practically drove himself into a nervous wreck at one stage. It required taking sort of the country's whole reserve of silver and throwing it into uh, making these plants. Uh, nickel was brought in in enormous quantities, which is why we have war nickels. It was, uh, you know, copper was brought in. Watch why we were using steel to make pennies in that stage. Uh, I mean, it required the resources of America to build this thing. And so, but it required understanding these processes at a very basic level to be able to design the right experiments, the right processes to getting this right, to not blow yourself up in the process of making a, a nuclear weapon. And those sorts of concerns required the theorists who could calculate how much of this enriched uranium, for instance, could you keep in one place before it became dangerous. Uh, I mean, it was always going to be dangerous with making a bomb, but you didn't want to blow yourself up in the process of making a bomb. So. Those sorts of questions preoccupied people and uh, required a harmonious interchange between, or at least a work, working together, even if not always harmonious, between the experimentalists and the theorists. And then you needed the people that knew how to scale up industrially, and they had to be brought into this too. And there were some real moments of tension. There was a time when uh, Eugene Wigner uh, was so anxious to create this nuclear weapon uh, and he felt like the industrial side of things at DuPont was not moving fast enough. And he wrote a letter to the president of the United States and said, we're going to lose the war if you don't get these industrialists to listen to us, us theoretical physicists. And they may know how to tan leather or do this or that industrially, but they don't know how to make a nuclear bomb. We do. But in fact, he was wrong. And without the industrialists who really knew how to make semi-plants, that is to say, how to scale up gradually from a desktop process to a mid-range process to a large industrial process, without understanding the problems of engineering at larger and larger scales, the big plants at Hanford never would have worked. And um, it was only uh, industrial knowledge about building excess capacity, contingency planning, building mid-sized plants, testing things out, may have driven someone like Wigner crazy, who in fact had some engineering training. But it, without it, the, the, there's no doubt the project would have failed, as many of the physicists, um, like the great John Wheeler, later recognized. They learned how to scale up to a large project by paying attention to these industrialists. There are many ways in which the physicists really learned uh, to respect the industrialist sense of design and scaling. One was uh, you know, Wigner and others calculated Wheeler, John Wheeler, for instance, also a great theorist and one of Richard Feynman's teachers. Um, John Wheeler's the guy who proposed the name black hole uh, for that extraordinary object that we are learning about today. But we, they figured out how big the reactor should be uh, to do what they wanted to do. And the industrialists said, no, you got to build some excess capacity because you never know, here's what we do, you know, we should add 20 percent or whatever, I don't remember the exact percentage, we should add some excess capacity here. And the physicists said, no, 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 we've calculated what it should be. Well, it turns out that there are all sorts of things that went wrong that they didn't expect. For example, when you break apart a uranium nucleus into smaller nuclei, one of the things you produce is xenon, another element, one of these fractional pieces of the uranium atom that, that, yeah, that breaks out. And xenon is, just loves to absorb neutrons. It just sucks it up. And if you're wanting to make a chain reaction so that each breaking a part of uranium nucleus causes some neutrons and they cause more reactions and more reactions, which you need to make a reactor work or eventually to make an atomic bomb work. But in order to make the reactor work, you had to have enough neutrons around. And if something was scooping them up and absorbing them, that wrecked things. So having that excess capacity uh, because of this unexpected, that no one knew that xenon would absorb neutrons like all get out, uh, uh, really saved the day. And in examples like that, and there are many of them, uh, Wheeler, uh, John Wheeler and others 
uh, began to respect the way these engineers thought. And even though uh, these industrial engineers hadn't had experience building an atomic bomb or a reactor, nobody did, uh, nobody had had that experience, they nonetheless uh, came to respect this process of going from small scale to large scale. And that was what happened all over the Manhattan Project. How do you make plutonium? Plutonium had been only known shortly before the war in microgram, you know, millions of a gram uh, quantities. How are you going to make tens of pounds, 20s, 30, 50, 100 pounds of this stuff um, when you had only had a millionth of a gram uh, earlier? So those sorts of questions, uh, scaling up on the plutonium production, scaling up on the separation of uranium to the useful part and the useless part, uh, those were all process of industrializing a process that only existed at the test tube desktop scale. And for that, it really required this triple coordination of uh, industrial engineering, theoretical science, and experimental science. Well, there are two kinds of legacy that you might see to the atomic bomb project. One is the legacy of nuclear weapons themselves. And that's been an extraordinary and extraordinarily dangerous history. And we're not done. So there are, there's the proliferation aspect of it uh, in terms of the numbers of weapons, the kinds of weapons, the number of countries that have it. We've been pretty lucky so far. We haven't had a post-World War II uh, atomic war or terrorist version of atomic war. And things have gotten pretty scary many times over the course of the Cold War and even outside of that framework. Uh, there have been moments when heavily nuclear-armed countries like Pakistan and India have come close to confrontation. There have been moments in the Middle East where uh, the, it was considered, there was a time in Korea when the United States uh, considered uh, the possible use of nuclear weapons. Um, there have been accidents where nuclear weapons have been dropped, not exploded, but fell out of airplanes. Uh, airplanes have crashed carrying nuclear weapons. Um, it's, it's, it's a precarious technology. And the idea that uh, it would only be held by a, a one or two or three or five countries uh, was never very realistic. Uh, the idea that even during World War II uh, that the Soviet Union would get it, people thought well, be, it would be four or five years before they would build an atomic bomb. And in fact, more or less on schedule in 1949, uh, the Russians did detonate their first atomic bomb. And then a huge arms race followed in which the country spent trillions of dollars and built numbers of weapons that no one imagined. I mean, people might have thought in the years after World War II, the scientists may have thought, well, people will build dozens or maybe a hundred, but nobody thought that the United States and Russia would each be fielding around 30,000 nuclear warheads each, or that they would build, um, depending on how you count, somewhere around 70 or 80,000 nuclear weapons uh, o over the course of the Cold War. Um, or that so many countries would eventually have it, or that uh, it would become cheaper and easier to get the equipment to make it. Uh, over time, it's going to be possible for many countries to have nuclear weapons. And the gamble has always been that we'd come to some kind of political understanding eventually that would make it not worthwhile for countries to continue to build and develop nuclear weapons. but. Um, I think it's been more luck than skill that we've not had the use of nuclear weapons over the last uh, 60 or 70 years uh, outside of World War II, which is really the first atomic war. Then there's the side of the legacy of the atomic bomb project that has to do with the whole relationship of science, technology, the military, uh, the coordination of large-scale efforts and scientific work. And that's a deep legacy of a different sort, and one that in some ways can be thought of as very hopeful. But out of the atomic bomb and then the hydrogen bomb, which followed quickly on its heels, uh, were fundamental developments in computers, uh, for example, that became very crucial 
simulations, for instance, that were developed first to understand the atomic and hydrogen bomb, and then uh, computer simulations now play a role in almost every branch of modern science. Modern astrophysics, for instance, is unimaginable without the ability to simulate the complicated processes involved in the early moments of the universe or the development of stars or, gal or galaxies. It's really foundational to our understanding of modern physics. Everything that's done in particle physics uh, uses simulations. And that's just one example. The national laboratories and the international laboratories, like CERN that sits on the Swiss-French border and that brings scientists in from all over the world, is a scale of engineering, theory, and experiment that really has its direct antecedent in the atomic bomb project. Um, so you have a fantastic, splendid history of, uh, of science that grew out of a role of funding models and a, a scale of work that came out of nuclear weapons uh, that really has nothing to do with nuclear weapons in the first instance, um, but has been very important. And then you have the history of, of, of weapons research in general and the role of science, technology, and, and the military in many countries that was transformed by this as well, not just for the building of atomic bombs, but for many aspects of mili military technology. So that's another aspect. Uh, the whole funding model, the way the government funded contract work in the United States uh, through the universities or government-owned company-operated plants, um, these are all structural, industrial, uh, economic relations that were founded and transformed the university, transformed the relationship of science and technology in the modern world, and it came out of the atomic bomb project in various ways.